Last week, we learned about the beginning of Jesus' ministry in the book of Mark. The Sunday before that, he had gather up, gathered up his, his fab four fishermen, Simon Peter and Andrew, his brother, and then the brothers James and John. And the five of them together went to the synagogue so that Jesus could begin his teaching. And it was the Sabbath day, so the temple was full. And while they were there, there was a man who was tormented by an evil spirit, and Jesus banished that spirit, and the man was healed. Jesus made this man whole. Now, simply by serving this man in the synagogue on the Sabbath, Jesus had already performed a task that the Pharisees would later berate him for. He had healed on the Sabbath. And this was a big no-no. Working on the Sabbath, it didn't matter that it was God's work, it didn't matter that it was humane work, it didn't matter that it was the right thing to do. Jewish law set aside that one day of the week for complete and total rest. And because they followed the letter of the law, the Pharisees, the silly humans that they were, they used that against him eventually in his ministry. But Jesus did this, and he did it deliberately. He was here to say that today was a new day, that the rules were about to be changed and thrown out the window. He was doing this deliberately. He was doing what the, the civil rights activist John Lewis called good trouble. He was deliberately getting into good trouble. This is Black History Month, by the way. And looking at today's text, we see that Jesus and his crew, they left the synagogue after, the, after they were done there, and they went immediately to the home of Simon Peter. And when they got there, they found Simon's mother-in-law in bed. She was in bed, and she was sick with a fever. And in these days, when you were sick and in bed with a fever, it was not good. It wasn't where, like Beth described, where you got to eat applesauce and watch TV for a couple of days. If you had a fever and you were in bed, your life was in mortal danger. Now, Jesus, it was a tendency of the time and unfortunately in some churches today, like the one I grew up in, where they would sometimes consider sickness to be punishment for sins, a punishment sent from God in judgment for sins. And Jesus rejected this. Jesus understood sickness to simply be a situation where a person was, was not whole. There was something missing that was putting this person at dis-ease. And in his healing, he brought about that wholeness. And when Jesus healed someone, they, they became complete. They became complete. Whatever was lacking in that person physically, as with Simon Peter's mother-in-law, or whatever was lacking spiritually, as in uh, with the man in the synagogue, Jesus made the unwhole person complete. And isn't that the intention of modern medicine today? Modern medicine or psychotherapy, or for that matter, religion? To find what is missing, to restore the wholeness, to restore the missing of being, of, of, to restore what's missing, and to restore that we're made complete. And we can't dismiss how Jesus healed this woman either. It said that he went to her and took her by the hand and raised her up. Jesus understood the power of touch, the power of intimacy, the power of nearness. Jesus understood what so many of us take a whole lot longer to comprehend, and that is that touch is another expression of love, another expression of intimacy, an expression of relationship. Jesus came to give the people intimacy with the Almighty God, 
with a God that up until that point was some mysterious being that, that lived up in the sky that they had no real connection with except through the temple and through sacrifice and through the priests. They had so many hoops that they had to jump through to get to God. And there were so many people who fell short of what they had to accomplish to feel like they were close to God in that time. But Jesus came to take all of those barriers away. He came to take away all of those hoops so that we and God could be intimate together. Theologically speaking, that's the reason for God's incarnation in Jesus. He knew, God knew the, the human need for nearness. Jesus knew that innate need, that innate desire. People are social Creatures, we do not do well in isolation. Jesus was the incarnation of God's love, and that makes it all the more demanding and somewhat overwhelming whenever we finally realize that to some people, we are the only Jesus they are ever going to meet. For some people, you are the only Jesus they are ever going to meet. heavy. But let's get back to Simon's mother-in-law. After Jesus took her by the hand and raised her up, the fever left her and she served them. This, this is something that I always, my brain kind of skipped over when I read it before. But she served them. It was the Sabbath, okay? Even very, very strict Jews today, they will prepare their meals for the Sabbath on the day before because it's considered working. And Jesus healed her, and she got up, and she served them. And here we, ha we have another example of this. But why? Jesus didn't command her to do this. She got up and simply assumed the initiative. And I think the reason why is because in her healing in her healing, she discovered the value of mutual service. And the fact that that mutual service, that, that the, the service, the connection that she had with Jesus was greater than the sacredness of the Sabbath. Jesus gave her the ability to serve, and so she did. And along with Jesus, she took her part in this radical new way of being. Simon's mother-in-law interpreted the gift that she had received. And her service, it's tempting to look at it as, as just menial women's work of the time under the dom domination of lazy males, but, but that's not true. This, this was true ministry. This woman was Jesus' first servant. And she went and she joined him in the radical announcement, in action, in the community of God, saying this is the new way things are going to be. Rules and regulations that don't mean anything in relationship to God, in relationship to other people, are irrelevant. If those rules get in the way of helping each other, if they get in the way of having a relationship, a community with each other, the sacredness of our relationship with God and each other is above all and everything else. Nobody taught this woman what to do. She was well aware when she was receiving Jesus' healing, and she responded to him in service because intuitively she knew that the calling and the pursuit of this man that had healed her was service. And the disciples don't understand this yet. The disciples... I don't know if they understand it even after Jesus goes to the cross. I mean, it takes them a while for things like this to sink in. Because they cannot perceive that the Son of God came to serve. To them, the Son of God came to conquer. But Simon's mother-in-law knew differently, and she overcame the restrictive teachings to do what she did. Later on in Mark, Jesus would tell the disciples, he would say, whoever wants to be first must be least of all and the servant of all. 
And I think we can take him in his word with that. God's gift and Jesus' grace transcends all the limits imposed by the rules of religion. With God, nothing is impossible. And I'm not talking about miracles, although miracles are possible. When I say that with God, nothing is impossible, I am talking about what is capable of happening when God's people come together with a single purpose. When God's people come together looking to get into good trouble. That evening after the Sabbath was over, by that time people had heard how Simon's mother-in-law had been healed. And when the Sabbath was over and the sun had gone down, they all came for healing. And they waited because they did not yet understand, they did not yet know that they didn't have to wait to come to Jesus. We don't have to wait to go to Jesus. We don't have to wait for the Sabbath to end. We don't have to wait until we've made ourselves good enough. We don't have to wait until this or that has happened. Whatever the reason it is that we have in our head that we are using as a reason to to put off going to Jesus, we don't have to wait. We can go right there and Jesus will welcome us with open arms. Jesus attended to all the people that came to him because for Jesus, even though it was getting late, even though I'm sure he was tired, The temple or the synagogue or the church, no place God ever is, is closed. We never have to wait. Just like in the in the um in the text from Isaiah, it said that God inhabits the earth. The entire tent of God covers the earth. Wherever we are, God is. We don't ever have to wait. Wrapping up the text for today. It says that Jesus, after he healed everyone, he escaped in the middle of the night to pray in solitude. God had sent him to offer humankind a declaration. And this declaration was of salvation. Don't be triggered by that word, (laughs) because I am sometimes. Salvation is the state of being made whole. Salvation is being made complete. If there's anything we're being saved from, it's being saved from whatever physical, whatever spiritual thing it is that we cannot conquer ourselves. It's like that cane. If you see me walking on it later, well, sometimes that happens. But sometimes we need help. Sometimes there are things that we cannot do on our own, and that's where God comes in. So Jesus gets away from it to pray, to clear his mind, to have a little bit of peace and quiet. I imagine Jesus was an introvert. But that's my own personal (laughs) personal picture of him. And the disciples go and they track him down. Where's Jesus? They went and they tracked him down and they say, everybody's looking for you. What are you doing? Where did you go? And he tells them why he's been sent. He says that he is going to go and give this message of salvation to the people who need it most. And this tells me that not only do we not have to wait to go to God, but God comes to us. God comes to meet us where we are, even in our times of greatest need, in our times of greatest darkness, in our times where we don't even think we're worth the next breath that we take in. If you struggle with depression, you know what I'm talking about. God comes to where you are, even if you're sitting in the darkness. God will come to you, and God will sit with you, and God will not leave your side until you get it through your head that you are worth your next breath. You are worth God's love. You are worth God's grace, and you are worth so much more because God created you so, and God says that it is the truth. The ministry of Jesus 
is preaching and healing and healing and preaching. And with each word and action that he put forth, he gave the message that God was among them in his person to make them whole and that their job, just like Simon's mother-in-law, their job after being made whole was to emulate what Jesus had done for them in service to one another. And that is still our calling today, to help in every way that we can to, bring, to be Jesus in this world today to those who need him the most. We do that work today here at Glade Church. We have had a basement full of people from to our house for the last week, and we'll have them for two more weeks. And every night they take shelter here, and they sleep in peace and safety, and we feed them. And we have members of our congregation who work with the Blacksburg Refugee Partnership. And, 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 and we, we are mentors to these people, and we are teachers to these people. And there are some of our members who are honorary grandparents to these families who are making their way in this new country. We work for the community of God, and that is regardless of whether or not the community is Christian. The community of God is not the Christian community. The community of God is the global community of God. All races, nations, creeds, and religions. And there is still work to do. And I know that together we are going to keep going and working and loving our neighbors in the name of God. Amen.